Yeah. All right, Boker Tov. Today's daf is Tzadi Vav, 96. Which, uh, um, um, so we, um, and we pick up at the very top, it's a short daf. We had been just um, discussing this issue about, uh, first of all, understanding when Torah says that if you cook a uh, chatos, and we're going to expand this to other korbanot, in a pottery vessel, you break it, and if it's a metal vessel, you like scald it and rinse it. Um, and the question was, is it about whether the vessel absorbed the taste, blia, or whether it was cooked in it? So we had the case about pouring boiling hot stew from a different pot into that, which is assumed to be not fishel, which is important, the idea that iroi is not fishel, but it get, does get absorbed, it is blia. So it might be that for, I mean, um, again, there's a way to read that that doesn't not fishel in this vessel, but it does achieve fishel. But reading it in the simplest sense, it's not fishel, so that's relevant for things like Shabbos, for things like uh, Basra Bechalov, but it is blia, so that's relevant for like kashras, that stuff would get absorbed through iroi. Anyway, that's that case. And we asked, what about the reverse case, something that was suspended in it, uh, but that wasn't actually touched to walls, which is your classic oven. Um, and uh, the Gemara's assumption, interesting for discussions about ovens, is that there's no blia, there's no absorption, but there is bishul. We didn't resolve that question. Okay, so that's that issue about the pots. And then it led the Gemara to a discussion about um, if you actually cook something in a pottery um, oven, um, that actually you can kosher the oven, even if it's made out of, uh, what do you call it, even if it's made out of, um, you know, uh, pottery, um, cheres, by, uh, by putting a fire in it and by burning it out, so that there is a way to kosher pottery. So the Gemara then asked, so then, why isn't there always a way to kosher pottery? And the answer is, well, because you have to have the fire on the inside, not on the outside. And you could try to do that by a normal pot, pottery pot, um, ceramic pot, but you would, you'd be afraid you would break it and we wouldn't trust you to do the job. But in an oven, when you do the fire on the inside, that really is a way to kosher pottery. One minute. So now the Gemara is going to have a question, which is, then why does the Torah say when you cook something, a chatos or whatever, in like a ceramic and a pottery pot, you have to break it? Why don't you just kosher it? If you're really telling me there is a way to kosher. Okay, your question in a minute, but let's just finish that thought. Top of Sadi Vav Amad Aleph. Ella says the Gemara, if that's true, Kedaris Shel Mikdash, Amayi Shavru. Why does the Torah say to your pottery pots break them? Nahadrinu Lukiv Shonot. Put them back into the kilns. That was the question and, I was going to ask. Excellent. See that? <laughs> so it might be true that we won't normally, like rabbinically, we'll say we don't want you to kosher that way. We're afraid that you won't, you know, put the fire hot enough on the inside and that you'll try to protect it and you won't do a good job. We get that. All of that is a rabbinic protection. Okay. But from the Torah's perspective, where there aren't these rabbinic protections, why was the Torah said that the only option is to break it? You're telling me that if you really completely put a fire on the inside of it, it's a way of capturing it. So why is that not an option in the Torah? Okay, is this really true? You can kosher pottery this way. So the Gemara says, you know what? In principle, it is. But here's why we don't do it. Actually, I'm, I, I misframed the question. The question isn't why did the Torah say? Tosa sort of asks that question. The question is why in practice? We'll get why the Torah doesn't say in a minute. But why in practice did they not kosher the pottery vessels in the Beit HaMikdash? Why didn't they just, you know, maybe you could trust the Quranim and so on. Why in the Beit HaMikdash in practice did they break it? Why didn't they just put them back into the kilns? And the answer is, so, because you don't make kilns in Yerushalayim, they create a tremendous amount of smoke, we're very protective about the air quality in Yerushalayim, etc. And therefore, in practice, you're right, if you waive the rabbinic restrictions, you can cast for pottery by putting it back in the kilns. Rabbis didn't let you do it, they didn't trust you. And the reason they didn't do it in the base of Mikdosh was just because that there were no kilns in Yerushalayim. Okay, now, two important things. One is the question that I asked a minute ago. That answers in practice why they didn't do it in the base of Mikdash, but it doesn't say why the Torah didn't say to do it. Okay, so we'll get back to that in a second. Um, the other point that I want to make is the question about whoever told you that it is sufficient to kosher, meaning the Torah gives you a ritual to do when you cook this stuff in it, <laughs> right? You either scald it and, uh, and rinse it by a metal vessel, or you go ahead and you break it by a pottery vessel. What makes, even if we'll assume, right, that the was assuming now that you can kosher pottery vessels by restoring them to their kiln and by putting a fire inside them or whatever, 
Whoever said that the Torah said it's enough to kosher the vessel? We're going to find out in a minute, for example, that, um, you know, if you scald a, a metal vessel, that's enough to kosher it, but that's not enough from the Torah. The Torah is a ritual. You scald it and then you rinse it. Okay, so maybe, who says koshering really suffices here? Why does the assume just because you could kosher it, it solves the problem? So you got the question? Mm -hmm. So Rashi says that he assumes that the Gemara had concluded its question before, and that the conclusion of the Gemara before was that it really is just about absorption. And that if you cooked something inside without it being absorbed, without it touching the walls, it would not have the halacha that you would have to scald it or break it or whatever. That really the whole halacha is when it absorbs. So Rashi actually says that based on the earlier discussion, yes, at the end of the day, it is really about koshering. So why the Torah also says you've got to rinse when it's metal? Who knows? If that's the way you're koshering it, then maybe the Torah added this extra ritual of rinsing it. But at the core, since it's about bleah, this requires the process of either shattering or scalding. This does not. So therefore, it really is about koshering. And if you could find another way to kosher, like returning it into the uh, kiln, that would suffice. And that's why the Gemara is saying, so why not just kosher the pottery vessels? Tosvos has two different answers to that. One is Tosvos is not prepared to say that we've concluded this question. And it could be that cooking without absorption actually uh, does require the same process. So it's not really all about <coughs> absorbing, and therefore it shouldn't all be about costuring. Nevertheless, as Tosfos, um, we're going to assume that even if this case is included, it's only cl included because Rashi is basically right. The conceptual model is absorb. The vessel absorbed, and therefore you've got to do something. Scald it, break it, etc. Okay, but including in the absorb, like, you know, like we sometimes say, shomea ka'one, if you like listen to a bracha, it's like you said it. The model still is saying it, but listening is like you said it. So it tells us, you know what, Rashi in principle is right. It's fundamentally is about absorbing, okay? But we're going to include cooking without absorbing as if it were absorbing, okay? So still, the, meaning I don't agree with you, Rashi, that this case does not require the process. It might be that this case does require the ritual. But I'll agree with you that the model remains the model of absorbing, and this case is like it absorbed. Since the model remains that of absorbing, then in the end, yes, I do agree with you, Rashi, that koshering another way, that's why the Gemara is assuming that koshering another way, like putting it back into the kiln, actually would work. So, okay, so it's a variation of Rashi. The Gemara says, why don't we just put it back in the kiln, which shows that fundamentally it's about absorption and koshering. It's just that Tosa says, you don't have to say we paskin that this is no good, that this is not required. This could be required, but it's still the model, okay, of it. Now, how do we know that's the model? Maybe it's just Stama ritual, right? Whoever told us that was the model. Sounds so like it's it, a ritual. It is a ritual, I know, but how do we know it's a ritual that's based on an idea of kosher, of koshering and absorption? So it says, well, since the Torah gives a different ritual for pottery and for metal, the only logic for that different ritual, breaking versus whatever, you know, versus um, uh, versus scalding, it only makes sense if the issue relates to whether the taste got absorbed into the vessel. That stuff gets more absorbed into pottery, and therefore it's harder to get out, et cetera, et cetera. So we can infer from the different treatment, and we're going to see later, right? What, one of the things we learn from the whole way that you kosher, the whole ritual by metal is how do you kosher metal? And one of the things we learn about the fact that you break the pottery is that you can't kosher pottery. So at the end of the day, the fact that there are these different rituals and, and, and there are these different physical attributes of these two vessels, okay, we, we infer that at the end of the day, really, it is about a question of absorption. So that basically is saying I agree with you, Rashi, but I just want to include this case as well. But in principle, given the difference of the rituals and the difference of the materials, it is about absorption. And therefore, the Gemara is saying, if you come up with a new way, which isn't the Torah ritual of breaking the pottery, if you really were to come up with a new way of koshering the pot, like putting it back in the kiln, in theory that could work. And that's the Gemara's question. Okay, and then the Gemara's only answer to that is, okay, but we don't have kilns in Yerushalayim. All right, so this has a yet a third answer about how putting it back in a kiln is like making it a brand new vessel. It's like, you know, and therefore, even if it's not about koshering, you've completely made it a new vessel. And therefore, you don't have to go through this process of this ritual because now you have like a brand new pot. Yerushalayim okay? produces no pottery. Well, yeah, you'd have to import it. Now, the question is, okay, now, um, here's, though, the next question. Why? That explains why they didn't do it in the time of the Beis HaMikdash, okay? Because they don't want kilns in Yerushalayim. But now we're still left with a question about, 
But why did the Torah say, break it? Why didn't the Torah give me an option of going ahead and restoring it to a kiln? The Torah doesn't have a gzeir, I won't do a good job. And the Torah didn't have the principle that in Yerushalayim we don't have kilns. So why did the Torah at least allow that as an option of restoring something to a kiln? That, you know, it explains why they didn't do it in practice, but why not allow it as an option? So if you take a look at Rashi, Rashi says three lines from the top, um, Okay, Keres, So Rashi says, you know what? The Torah didn't say it either, because you don't have kilns as you're walking through the wilderness of Sinai. Okay, so that's how Rashi's answer. It wasn't in the Psukim because it wasn't relevant in the Psukim either. All right, Tosos has a different answer. Tosos's answer is that actually, this is going to come as a surprise, but once we've established that the idea is about absorption, the fact that you break a pot is actually a leniency. Why is it a leniency that you break a pot? The Torah is telling you you're even allowed to break a pot. You want to restore it to a kiln? Be my guest. So why is it a leniency? You think that that's being very strict. You're telling me you have to destroy it. No, because if the whole point is to get the taste out of the walls, when you break the pot, you haven't gotten the taste out of the walls. So I might think that breaking the pot, although it destroys the pot, maybe that's not sufficient. Maybe the Torah demands that I actually destroy the taste from the world. I actually extract it from the walls. Okay? So that could explain why the Torah is telling you you're even allowed to break it. But you want to restore it to a pound? Be my guest. Okay, so now where we are in the Gemara is we've established that in principle you can cash your pottery by making the fire on the inside, not at the outside, or presumably immersing it in fire, like doing a kiln, but the rabbis don't trust you to cast your pottery that way. Um, it, in theory, would be a way to deal with the stuff of this, that you cook a chatas in and so on, because now we've established that one way or another that implicitly these rituals in the Torah about the cooking of the korbanot are anchored in an idea of koshering and absorption, and therefore, in theory, restoring it to a kiln would work for the pots in the mikdash, but we're just not going to do it because we don't want kilns in Yerushalayim. Okay, and now the Gemara continues. So, so but wait, but if it's really, uh, uh, so why is the Torah letting you break it? Then? I mean, it's not koshering it, it's just ruining it. Right, okay, because at the end of the day, if you're not going to use it, Presumably that's fine, even though the taste remains in the walls. If you're not going to use it, it's fine. So then, now, getting back to the same thing with the bide kahuna, you're not going to use it anymore. Why would you need to launder them? Or are you saying that's such a special thing? By yeah, I can't. Uh, I can't. I'm not, it's a good question. I'm not. I can't assume that it's the same principle for both. Okay, so now the gemara says like this. Amar bai. So bai says v'chi osin ashpatot basara. So rabbi says, I, what do you mean? Oh, okay. We're, we can't do a kiln because we can't make kilns in Yerushalayim. Okay, you know what else you shouldn't be doing? You shouldn't making you shouldn't be making garbage heaps in the Azara. But there you are. No, you're just you're breaking pots in the Azara. Is that a nice thing to do? To take all your pots and throw them on the ground and have all these little shards there? So it's also not a nice thing. So as long rather than make a lot of shards in the Azara, why not make a little kiln? So Ishtamitate, so he forgot Hadatani, that which we taught. Shemaya Hadatani Shamaya, that were Rav Shamaya, because Shamaya would be a little early, um, that that which Rav Shamaya taught, the Kalanbo, Kalanbo is some place. Okay, yeah. what? It's a city in Babel. City in Babel. Mm -hmm. Okay. Shivre Klecheres Nivloin Bin Koman. Ah, it was a miracle. When they broke the pottery vessels, they got absorbed right there magically in the place. So that's the answer to Rabbi's question. All right. Anyway, you could also just say also, you know, break it and then you sweep it away yeah, or right, something. Right. Who says you leave it there? True, true, anyway, true. it's still not as bad as having a, a, an ongoing kiln. Anyway, fine. So that's our answer. Our answer is that at the end, this is rooted in an issue of absorption. Koshering through a kiln would in theory be okay, but in practice, it doesn't work out. Ela, fine. Now the Gemara says like this. Ela had amarav nachman amarav baravua. Hanor shem nikta shem mateches habei. One minute, but we said yesterday that they had a metal oven, okay? And that led to our question about whether, whether if you suspended something, would it require kashering? And we said, well, not everything was suspended. There were the breads that weren't suspended. Fine, but they had a metal oven. Presumably, the reason they had a metal oven was because you, you don't want to start having to shatter your ovens every time you use them. But according to you... Just put the fire back in the oven. Re like do you know, you know your self cleaning oven. You know fire it at, You know you know fire it up, and that should be fine. So why not use a pottery oven? Okay, never the cheres the seiko mi 
Why not do it off pottery? Since there you're putting the fire on the inside, you don't need a kiln, which is like an immersion in fire. You just have the fire on the inside. That's where this whole discussion started, that if a fire is on the inside of an oven, it can kosher a pottery oven. So why didn't they have sorry, So this is somehow better than making a kiln? Yeah, a kiln, you basically is like, you know, you've got a raging fire and you put pottery inside of the kiln. Okay, and I, you know, you, and you mean in terms of like the smoke and the pollution yeah. issue? Yeah, I don't know what, what to say about that, but you need an oven. Okay, so Lamai said they had an oven anyway. Mm -hmm. Okay, and since the fire is on the inside, okay, so why don't we just, what do you call it? So why do, why not, fire, uh, uh, a pottery oven should be fine. We'll, we'll kosher it. We don't have to break it. So, Amar's answer is no. No, 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 no. Here's the point. The point is you're right. In the terms of principles of using the oven to cook a chatas in or whatever wouldn't be a problem. You know, just turn it on for an hour to the highest temperature. You're all ready for Pesach. You're all ready to use it for the next thing. No problem. The reason was, it's not that we can't kasha it. The reason was, was that there are certain breads that because they don't have oil in and you don't mix it in a klisharis ahead of time, that the, the that the klish, their klisharis is the oven itself. So the shtei alechem and the lechem upon him and also the mincha of mafei tanur, since they, they're baked in the oven and to shosan betanur, that's where they become sanctified, havilei clay charet. The oven for them is the clay charet. Okay, it's not that it's put in some other vessel ahead of time that it's mixed with oil or whatever. The che and the clay charet, one minute, let me finish my sentence. The clay charet is the cheres lo avdina. So we don't make a clay charet out of pottery. So in principle, you're right. If we wanted to have an oven designated for the cooking of of the uh, of the meat sacrifices, then it would not. Then we would not have to. It would be fine. And then we would just fire it up and cleanse it out, and we wouldn't need to go through this ritual of breaking it or whatever. The only reason we need a metal one is because we want to be using the oven also as a klisharis. And there's a halacha that you don't make klisharis out of pottery. If you just turn the page, the field of Yosef Reb Yehuda lo kamer el de eights. Right, there's a whole debate whether you can make a klisharis out of wood, whether the manure initially mm -hmm. was out of wood or whatever. Even he only allows wood. Oh, the cheres low, but everybody agrees that pottery is too like sort of mundane of a material for a klisharis. And based on the verse that we learned it out from the menorah, etc. So there's a question whether it has to be metal or can it even be wood. But everybody agrees that a klisharis is not allowed to be out of pottery, and that's why. So now we have concluded that in theory pottery can be kashered, and the only reason that we don't, is, in general, we don't trust you to do a good job to put the fire on the inside. Ovens that the fire is on the inside can be kashered. And the only reason, and number one, and number two, the whole rituals here by the breaking and the and the scalping or whatever are rooted in absorption. And therefore, in principle, koshering should work for the clay chairs in the mikdash. It's not stama ritual. It's a ritual rooted in absorption and in koshering. Um, and uh, for just practical reasons, we don't do this with the clay, with the clay cheres and the mikdash. But this, but this day, lechem lechem I don't understand. I mean, if you're not putting in water, you have to put. It, you're not putting in oil, put in water. You have right. to mix that in something. Yeah, it's not. It's not. Yeah, I don't know. I, it, you're right. It's not that it's like physically impossible. You could like put it in clay cheres with the water ahead of time. Um, but for whatever reason, I, I I don't have a full answer that way. Okay, mm -hmm. about why why it wouldn't be possible. In theory, it is possible. But lemaisa that was the, the the oven was the clay cheres was yes. You could absolutely capture uh, pottery by putting it back in the kiln, but typically pottery is painted. And while the pottery itself will do fine in the kiln, right. whatever is in the outside is going to be destroyed. Which I guess is helpful in getting back to why the commercial says we don't trust you to do a great job. Yeah. Because you'll be afraid you'll destroy it. Yeah. yeah. I was actually asked a question just the other day about, about Paris and about pottery, which is like, okay, you can't capture it because you can't get the taste out. But why don't you just go ahead and like, you know, cook it in bleach, and then the bleach will go into the walls of the pot, and it will be po-game any taste in it, and that, why isn't that enough? So it's like, okay, that's a good question. Anyway, so now the verse is like this. Okay. Uh, now, now the Gemara continues. Um, Rav Yitzhak Bar Yehuda, Havi Ragil Kami to Rami Bar Chama. Here's a great little story. Rav Yitzhak Bar Yehuda usually would be spent most of his time in front of Rami Bar Chama. Um, um, Shavke, but then he decided, like, nah, I need a different Rebbe. So he left Rami Bar Chama, the Azal Rav Sheshis, and went to Rav Sheshis to learn by Rav Sheshis. Yom Achad Pagabe. So one day Rami Bar Chama bumped into his, his, his ex Talmud, former Talmud, Talmud uh, Rav Yitzcha. Okay, Amale. So this is apparently some common statement, which is that, uh, you know, basically you went to a, 
Rashi says an officer, I think the tax, uh, collector. tax collector, I saw that Steinzelt said, and you think that because you like shake hands with an important person, you're gonna, some of their nice smell is gonna rub off on you. So you like, you're going to some other rabbi for the status purpose and what, you didn't like me. So you wanna be a, you wanna be a big shot. So you think just because you hang around with Rav Sheshesh, you'll be like Rav Sheshesh, which is a fascinating point. Like he didn't want to assume that Rav Sheshesh was a better teacher than him. Like he didn't want to assume that he left me because I wasn't a good teacher. Maybe he thought he'd get a better education by Rav Sheshesh, but he was okay under assuming that Rav Sheshesh was a person of greater status and of greater like, you know, like uh, like more chashuv. So he said, you know, you went to him because he's more chashuv. Because he's a better teacher, but maybe you went to him because he's more chashuv. Okay, anyway, so he said, I'm relayed. No, love me shum hachi. No, no, no. I didn't leave him for that reason. I didn't leave him because of Hashiva. What? I didn't leave you for that reason. I didn't leave, right. I'm sorry. I didn't go to him. I didn't leave you for that reason. Love me shum hachi. But it actually had to do with, I was concerned about my education. So, Mark, which is not what a teacher wants to hear. Mark, he ba'ina milsa, when you, Rami Barcham, when I asked a question from you, Pashitli misvara. You said, ah, misvara, you gave me a logical or good logical answer, but you didn't base it on any text. They, they, they suggest it's from him, and I inquire of him, although it's not in the text. But they, no. They, they no, 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 I think you're jumping to the next line. Okay, Let, let's keep oh, okay. on reading. Okay, let's keep oh, on yes, reading. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Maybe okay, I yeah. Jumped the line. yeah, 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 okay. So, so when I asked you a question, you would give me an answer based on some, you know, reasoned out position, but not based on a text. And then, okay. this is the debate on the Gemara, which is better. Right, right exactly. Masnisa, but then I would show you a brighter that would prove you wrong. And Pirchala, and that would contradict what you said. So your logic might have been brilliant. Mm -hmm. but, but they suggest that. Well, let me just finish this, and then you don't worry, okay? Anyway, and then I would give you, you know, I, I would, you would give me some logic. I would show you a contradiction, and uh, and that would contradict you, okay? And then that would be the end of the conversation. So that doesn't help me that you just stop say things from Svara. In the end, I don't wind up with some real facts. Because you have another counter. Uh, right, Svara. exactly. Well, not just a counter Svara. I actually have a counter text, mm -hmm. okay? If it's a counter Svara, you could maybe persuade me why your Svara is better. But at the end of the day, Svara is all nice and fine, but they, but if there's a text that contradicts, the text contradicts. For Rav Sheshis, but when it comes to Rav Sheshis, Kiba Ina Milsa Mine, when I ask him a question, Pashilini Masnisa, he has a text to produce. He shows me a bright to support his position. The chinam is bach masnisa. Then and that you know what? If you've got a text, even if I find a counter text uparcha, and that contradicts his text, masnisa masnisa. It doesn't completely reject his position because fine. Then I have two competing texts, and then he can tell me. I'll tell you why I favor my brighta over that brighta. Or at best, it'll be a draw. But at least what he told me won't be, it doesn't have run the risk of being completely rejected. Everything you tell me runs the risk and the sense you got was just run the risk. Maybe there was a high likelihood, a high occurrence of the things you told me wound up getting rejected because I had counter texts. He tells me things based on texts. So even if I have counter texts, his things are still legitimate. And you know, and then, and that maybe is what you throw in a svara. There maybe his svara could convince me. I'm adding this. This isn't in the Gemara, but anyway, why his text is better than my text? So I'd much rather go to him. There, at least, I wind up with something firm under my belt. With you, I'd never know if I can trust it all because there might just be some contradictory text. That's not what your English says. No, uh, it was confusing. Okay, fine. Yeah, it's interesting. He's saying he was actually talking as you suggested. Yeah, 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 fine. Okay. It's interesting so, that he's saying this now and not before, you know, like maybe we can work something out here. I don't believe you. You know, <laughs> you know right? what? People are like, you know, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. People are like, you know, set in their ways. And now we're going to have a very humorous story as this continues. So let's keep on going. I'm going to lay. So, so uh, Rami Barchama said, yeah. He says, boy, me, me, Go ahead. Ask me anything. The if and I will, can, I will deduct it for you uh, from Svara. Okay, you're right. That's what I do. I figure out things from Svara. But Kimas Nisa, we'll find out that my Svara will be supported by a Brighta. It'll be just like something we'll find in a Brighta. Yes, I'm going to learn out from Svara. Your problem is you need a text. Don't worry. We'll find a text. Okay. Boy, Mine, he asked from him, Bishop of Mixus Kli, Ton Marika Vestifo Ainton. Let's say I cooked, you know, in a pot, and it's only in the bottom inch of the pot. When I go ahead and I have to kosher the pot, this is not a normal pot. This is, again, for the case like a chatos, like the case of the Torah, okay? If I go ahead and the Torah says I have to do a scalding and a rinsing, it's whatever, I cook this chatos, do I have to do it just at the bottom of the pot or do I have to do it with the whole pot? 
Good question. He didn't exactly okay. say. So, okay, that's the question. <laughs> okay, what's the halacha? Okay, so that's his question. So, oh, ain't tone. I'm a lay. Ain't no tone. It doesn't have, you only need to do the bottom of the pot, in this case of the chatas or whatever. You don't have to do the whole pot. Midi dahave haza. Just like when the blood sprinkles on a garment, you don't have to launder the whole garment. Here too, you don't have to uh, kosher or do the scalding on the whole pot. That's reasoning. That's a gut reasoning. He, he, <laughs> he's not. He's not saying I'm going to stop using my svara. He's just saying I'm going to show you that I can figure out things from svara, and in the end, that we, they will be supported by a brayta. So he says, "Hello, Tanahachi." So what, one minute, where's the brayta to support it? <laughs> okay, there's no brayta that supports that. You're just I'm saying it from Swara. <laughs> I'm like, wait, Mistavra, again from Swara. It makes sense. <laughs> Kibeget. Ma beget ain't no tone kibus elamokamadab, the same way by Garm, which is just elaborating what he said a minute ago. You only do it where the blood is. Avkli ain't no tone marika mashkiv elamokabisho. Here too, by the khatas and the pot or whatever, the ritual as applies only to the place of the scalding and the rinsing, only to the place where it was cooked. So that's again not exactly a bright unless what he says is based on my svara, it is anchored in a Tanaitic source because it's anchored in the Mishnah. The same thing the Mishnah says about blood, my svara will bridge the gap from that Mishnah to our case. So in the end, it is somewhat anchored in a source. Amrlay, me dummy. Since when is it comparable? Dam lo mifapeya. Blood doesn't spread throughout the garment. So of course you only have to do it where the blood is. Bishu mifapeya. If you cook, even if you cooked at the bottom, the taste spreads throughout the whole pot. And therefore, even, even purely, forget text, purely on a logical basis, your, your comparison, your, you know, is, can, can, be, can be challenged. Okay, even logically, yes, I understand your analog, but it's not a precise analog. Because since when you cook stuff in a pot, the taste spreads throughout the pot, okay, there's a reason to think that actually you would have to kosher the whole pot. That's just using svara. And not only that, I got a text, okay? The, oh, Tanya, we taught a text. Okay, you got a text. Why is he asking the question? I, uh, I just well, like, uh, well, see how it answers. Yes. If, if you want to convince me to come back to you, you challenge me, <laughs> ask me something. Let's see how you do on this. On this, we got a bright time. The stringencies of the blood cleansing over the marika and shkifa of the pot, and there's stringencies the other way. The blood halach applies even on an inner chatas, okay? And the marika and shkifa does not, because marika and shkifa is only on something that you eat, and you don't eat an inner chatas, it's only when you cook some of the meat that you eat. The yeshna lifnei zrika, and also the halach of the blood applies, if you'll remember, before the blood has been put on the altar. Mashain came from Rika Vashkifa, not by Rika Vashkifa. Rika Vashkifa is only meat that can be eaten. It's only the outer chatas. And it only is on, therefore, only on blood after the blood has been put on the altar. That's when the, chata, the meat can be eaten. Okay? Chome by Rika Vashkifa. Now, Rika Vashkifa is more weighty. Shem Rika Vashkifa, no hagas bain bekachi kachim bain bekachim kalim. It's not limited to a chatas. It extends even to kachim kachim. It's not even limited to kachim kachim. It even applies to kachim kalim. So it applies to a much bigger scope of korbanot. And not only that, Here's also how Marika and Shifa is stricter. If you do a, if you cook in part of the a pot, you have to do Marika and Shifa in the whole pot. Okay, so it's like an explicit right that shows you that you're wrong. This is a perfect illustration of why I left you for Rav Sheshis. You used your Svara. You claimed your Svara was, was anchored in a Mishnah. At the end of the day, number one, your Svara could be challenged. And number two, there's an explicit right that shows you that you're wrong. Much ink in buzzer. I'm a lay. Itanya, Tanya. Fine. You got a bright day. You got a bright day. Which is like classic. <laughs> this is classically why he left. He's like, I'm going to give you a whole wonderful swara. I say, but I got a bright. He says, okay, you got a bright though. What can I do? You got a bright. I still like my swara. You got a bright though. You got a bright though. Okay. Which basically, it's a phrase that actually. It's like a it's like a begrudging concession, yeah, yeah. you know, because it still is coming from somebody who is more in a world of just svara, and you know, and therefore, look at the end of the day, if you, if you got to concede to a text, you concede to a text. It doesn't mean that that's your orientation to be looking for all the texts. Your orientation is still to figure things out from svara. If you have to backtrack a few times because you've got some contradictory texts, then you'll backtrack. Okay, but now you see this is exactly why he left him to go to Rosh to go. To to, uh, to go to Rav Papa, right? It was no to go to Rav Sheshes, okay. The time am I now? Taka, what is the reason 
why you have to do it. So what do you mean? We just gave a good reason that it spreads throughout the whole clique, right? But we could even give a reason, interestingly, <laughs> maybe consistent with the idea of like we're here showing a preference for text over svara, rather than just giving the reason of like, oh, because when you cook it spreads, we're going to give a reason that's, meaning we're going to give a basis on a pasta by a verse. Amar Kra, the verse says, <laughs> if it was cooked in a kli, <laughs> In somehow, I don't know how in means even in part of it, but that's bigly. Somehow means even part of the vessel, you have to go ahead and cook the whole thing. So even when it comes to giving a svara, we're not giving a logical svara, which we could have given. We could have said it spreads throughout. But in the end, the svara we gave really was just a basis in a verse. Okay, so it's a great little dynamic here, which is like, yeah, now we see exactly why I left you. <laughs> and you think, yeah, don't worry, I'll show my stuff will be consistent with all the bright does. I'll find a supporting bright. And in the end, you didn't. In the end, it was directly contradicted by it. <laughs> okay, so now the Gemara says like this. Um, okay. Um, Echad Kachi Kachim, whether it's Kachi Kachim or Kachim Kalim, now we're going to get to this idea, which is that we, as opposed to the blood, which is only by a chatos, this applies to all korbanot. Okay? Um, so, and then Rabbi Shimon, I think, says, not by, yeah, Rabbi Shimon says, not by Kachi Kachim Kalim. Tanar Banan, Chatat. It says, speaks about if you cook from a chatat. I only know a chatat. Kol Kachim Nain, how do I know to include other Kachim to this halacha about cooking in a pot? Kam Gomar, Kodesh Kadashim He. Okay, because the end of that verse says, it is holy of holies. Okay, so meaning it's sort of broadening the point here that it's not just about a chathos, but it speaks about the cooking in the pot. Yochot shani mar truma. Now, of course, that would say you should limit it to kachim kachim. How do you know kachim kalim? We'll see in a minute. Anyway, maybe therefore I'll include, maybe I'll go so far to include truma. Talmud Lomar, the verse teaches osa. Okay, it says, Yochal osa will eat it, which is a limiting thing, which means it's not everything. It ends by truma. It ends at the end by it doesn't go further than korbanot. Prat truma. Do Rebbe Yehuda? That's what Rebbe Yehuda says. The Pshimon Omer Kodesh Kachim Kachim Tunim Rikav Shifa. No, it says Kodesh Kadashim He. So only the Holy of Holies Kachim Kalim Ain Tunim Rikav Shifa. Not Kachim Kalim like a Shlomim. The Chsiv Kodesh Kadashim Kodesh Kadashim Kachim Kachim In Kachim Kalim Lo. That's a very reasonable position mm -hmm. of Rabbi Shimon. Mm -hmm. My time to Rabbi Yehuda. So why does Rabbi Yehuda extend it to Kach Kalim? So Rabbi Yehuda will tell you, truma. If all it applied to was Kodesh Kach Kachim, you wouldn't need Ota. You would say Kodesh Kadashim He, and I would know Kodesh Kach Kachim Yes, Kach Kalim No. So what's Osa doing? Why do you need Osa to limit? So, but the fact that you need Osa to limit shows me. The Kodesh Kadashim is not limited to Kodesh Kadashim. It was literal, then you wouldn't need a limiting word. And it means that Kodesh Kadashim I should read in an expansive way to include all things that are holy. And then Osas comes and says, wait, wait, not everything, not Truma. So what I sort of, you know, so what I get in between the Osa exclusion of Truma and the literal meaning of Kodesh Kadashim is Kodesh Kadashim. Mm -hmm. But if Kodesh Kadashim was literal, I wouldn't need the Osa. The fact that I need the Osas tells me that Kodesh Kadashim is broader. Okay, and Osa draws a line. So Osa draws a line at Truma, but the broader aspect of Kodesh Kadashim is to include Shlamim, is to include Kachim Kalim. Okay, so, uh, wait a minute. Mikhlao, the Kodesh Kadashim, to Unim Rika Bashim, that shows me the Kachim Kalim is included. Reb Shimon Amalacha, Reb Shimon will tell you, Osa Kid Amrina. No, Osa, we, we learned from the earlier halacha. You might remember, Reb Shimon used Osa to tell me the idea that, what do you call it, that even, um, a, uh, this halacha about the blood of a chatas, right? That it does it apply to when it, when a chatas it had a shasa kosher, it didn't have a shasa kosher. You might remember we had that discussion earlier, right? About when about what types of chataot are excluded, and even one that was pasul even after it had a shasa kosher is excluded based on the osa. So he uses this osa not for the whole cooking context where it appears, but for the earlier verse, which was about the blood of the chatas to exclude certain chata'ot from this halach of the blood of the chathas. Okay, so that's what it's functioning for him. The true malobaya, and therefore, osa is not coming for saying something here, it's saying something about the blood of the chathas, and obviously truma is excluded because it's only about kachim kachim. So therefore, it's only about kachim kachim, kachim kalim and truma are equally excluded. Okay, um, now, now the mark continues. Shki, uh, lo bai shki from Marif. Now the okay, kedamim. Period. I'm sorry, I, I I put the bit in the wrong place. Kedamim. Period. Now the mark continues. The truma lo bai shki from Marika. Now are you telling me that because they, they both agree that this does not apply to truma? So are you telling me that truma does not need the shki from Marika? How could that be? Um, shki again is the sort of scalding and the rinsing. That time you talk to the brisa, and now we're going to turn to a general kashras kashring pot absorption halacha. Okay, if you cooked meat in a uh, pot, don't use it for milk. 
That's the ABCs of a kosher kitchen. Being beef show, but no same time. If you use your meat pot for cooking milk, then does it trafe up the milk? It depends. Is there enough meat flavor that it could give taste into the milk? Okay, and the whole way we compute that, one in 60 and so on. Truma, if you used your pot for cooking truma, don't cook non-truma in it. Okay, if you don't want your non truma to, to become truma, the in beef shell, and if you did cook for no same time, now that won't trafe it up, it might mean that you'll have to get a coin to eat it. But if the truma taste absorbed in the pot now goes into you know the stew that you're cooking and you can taste the truma taste, and how exactly you determine that again, one in 60, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, anyway, then one minute, hold on, then your stew is a problem and you would only allow a coin to eat it. So, anyway, the first question is you see that when you cook truma in a pot, you actually um, it, tra it, it, it gets absorbed and it could ha it impact the stuff you're going to cook afterwards. So what do you mean when you say the psukim are only talking about korbanos, they're not talking about truma, but and when you have a truma in a pot, you don't need to do this ritual, but you do need to do this ritual. If you don't do this ritual when you cook a truma in a pot, it can, get, it can impact stuff you're going to cook in it, okay? Which is really another way of saying how is what you do by the pot in the mikdash mm -hmm. of the scalding and the rinsing different than any koshering you would do at home mm -hmm. for any pot that absorbed taste that you don't want, whether it's treif, whether it's milk, it's whether, whatever, you always have to kosh your pots. So what's your point of saying, no, 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 the ritual in the Torah only applies to, you know, to Kodesh Kodashim, et cetera, and it doesn't, or Kodesh Kodashim, and it doesn't apply to other things. But you got to kosh or anything. So wh wh what's the significance of saying whether it's in the ritual, in the psukim, or not in the ritual of the psukim? So let's see what the Gemara's answer is. So, so, um, we're in it. Amar baye, lo tzicha el adamar mar. Bishop mixes kli, ton riku shifa kol hakeli. Hatruma lo tzarech, el mokum bishop. And this is wild. What, what Abai says is, here's the way the ritual is different than the normal halachas of koshering. Normal halachas of koshering, you would not have to do the entire vessel. You could just do the part that you cooked in. So in theory, if you went ahead and this pot I've used, here it is, here's my soup pot, okay, that I used for flacious, okay? And then uh, and then somebody came and he did a little bit of, well, whatever, let's, let, 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 let's just start this. Here's this brand new pot that I bought my soup pot, and I and first time I used it, I used it for, Slay chefs down here, and the chicken soup chicken only soup. went to that level. Mm -hmm. Okay, and now I realize, darn, I wanted to make it a milk pot, so I have to kosher it. So normally, what would you tell me to do to kosher it? You would normally tell me, fill it up, put it, wait 24 hours, fill it up, put it on hot water, blah, blah, blah. A buy is saying is actually, you could just fill it up up to this point with water and kosher it. Pretty amazing. And that the same way it went in that way, and presumably the logic is, and this gets back to the first point about, don't you need to do the whole thing because it spreads, but assuming we, presumably the logic is, if this spread throughout when you cooked it, then if you cook water here, it'll spread throughout, and it'll just reverse the process, okay? Mm -hmm. So even if it's true that it spreads, just do the same thing you did to get it in, and that'll get it out. So the halacha that we said a minute ago, that you need to do the whole pot, that's a special ritual by, uh, you know, korbanot, a whole pot. Normal koshering only requires you go to the level of how far the thing got. Now, in practice, of course, we don't say that. In practice, we <laughs> say you got to fill the whole thing up. We even say that it's got to be, you know, overblow because over maybe things overblew. Okay. <laughs> we also say that you've got to get it to the point of boiling. Even if I've only ever used this to 150 degrees, when I cooked it, I got to get it to 212. Right? That's boiling. I remember that from yeah, yeah, high yeah, school yeah. science. <laughs> anyway, because we always want you to do the extreme to make sure you're covering your bases, but. What Abai says, in principle, actually, you could kosher just by going to the level of use. The ritual demands that you do it to the whole pot. Okay, so that's different, number one, of how the ritual is different from koshering. Number two, um, it says, because when it says about umurak v'shutaf b'mayim, that the ritual is water, so you have to dot to use water. Okay, Bemayim Velo Biyayim. You can't kosher with you can't do the ritual with wine in the mikdash. Bemayim Velo Bemazuk. You can't even do mixed wine. Okay. Ha, but if you're gonna kosher a pot, a filo biyayin, vafilo bemazug, you can use other liquids to kosher a pot. 
It doesn't have to be water. So I bet you didn't know that. But if you wanted a kosher pot, you could use, I mean, why you would, it'd be a waste of some good stew or some good wine. But in theory, koshering doesn't require water. Okay, you can use other liquids. The ritual requires water. So what's now special about the ritual? Right now, the ritual here in the mikdash, which the ritual of the mikdash, well, first of all, it has to be done in the mikdash. Okay, mm -hmm. but even but that but that's because you're dealing with korbanot. But besides which, okay, it has to be filled. Okay, kol hakli, and it's only water. And the actual koshering can can be up in theory can be only up to the place it was used and can be other liquids. Now, by the way, the fact that koshering can be other liquids is actually a good question. I think it's already in the rash, or which is here. Here I was. I cooked chicken soup in this pot. Okay, then yeah. That's two, two days ago. Today, I cooked vegetable soup. After I cooked vegetable soup, I went ahead and I cooked mi milk in this pot or whatever. Oh, wow, yeah. So, yeah. what is the milk not kosher? Or let's say, let's say I cooked the chicken soup earlier today, okay? I cooked chicken soup at 9 a.m. At, I mean, that gets the whole question about whether you have to wait 24 hours before costing, but let's bracket that for a moment. I cooked chicken soup at 9 a.m. At 10 a.m., I cooked vegetable soup. At 11 a.m., I cooked milk. So you could say, you know what? The milk is kosher. Why? Vegetable soup. The vegetable soup was kosher the pot. <laughs> the vegetable soup is just like water. Yeah. I kosher it with vegetable soup. So that's actually an issue that gets discussed in the halacha about whether that works because it's only here that you dafka need water. Okay. Mm -hmm. Here you have to fill it. We lemaisa fill it. You here you need water. Of course, we lemaisa use water, but in principle, neither of those are required by normal kosher. Let's do the third thing. Okay. Rabbi Bar Ula Amar Lo Tzricha El Adamar Mar. You need it for what we taught. Marika Veshtifa Bitsoni. That Marika Veshtifa is two types. I've been translating it as scalding and rinsing, but we're going to see there's one opinion. It's coming up in the Mishnah that it's two forms of cold water. Okay, two rinses of water. We'll see how they're different. But obviously, so the first thing you do is you kasher with a scalding. That isn't even mentioned. The ritual in the Torah is two Marika and Shifa is two other rinsings of cold water. Ha, But when you kasher, you just use hot water and you know, you don't need it to follow rinsings of water. Okay? So the Mishnah says, Hani klamanda marika b'shiva b'tzonin. That's if you say they're both cold. Elamanda marika b'chamim b'shiva b'tzonin. But if the marika is the hot water and the shiva is the cold water, so both of them have hot water, so the answer is fine. Both of them start with hot water. But no, at least the ritual requires a cold rinse. Okay? So that is not by kasher, okay? So cold rinse, the cold rinse after is only real, is really only a halacha by the ritual in the mikdash, all right? If so, and by kashering, in theory, you just do the hot water. Now, lemasa, a ritual developed, a minug developed in the time of the Rishonim, that when we kasher pots, we also put them in cold water after we're done. I don't know if you ever was one of those big Pesach kasherings that yeah. they put in the boiling thing, and then they put them in cold water. And that's probably patterned after this. So actually, what we do in practice when we kasher is we do do all these three things as a practice. We fill it, we use water, we do a rinse after. But in principle, these are only rituals that apply in the mikdash, and they're not really needed for kasher. Okay, so this was a very nice little way of highlighting what is unique about the ritual, about the mikdash ritual. That's not just about kasher. Okay, let's just read the mishnah. We'll end with that for today. Rabbi Tarfin Omer, Bisho mitchilas haregel yivashe bokol haregel. If you started a pot cooking with it at the beginning of a regel, like Pesach or whatever, you don't have to do the rinsing and the scalding, or if it's pottery pot, you don't have to break it every day. You can just keep on using it throughout the regel, okay? Because there's just so much meat or whatever, <coughs> somehow that means that you don't have to, it doesn't get no sun, you don't have to break it. We'll see what that is in the Gemara, okay? Or, or scald it. <laughs> no, I don't care if it's the regel or not the regel. Once the time of eating of the meat is over, then the pot has to be processed in whatever way, you know, either the scalding or the uh, or the breaking. Um, okay, Marika Vashkifa. Now, when you get to the Marika Vashkifa, Marika Kimarika Sakos. Marika is like you would uh, rinse out a gap, ga, a ga, a ga, assuming these are both cold, meaning you're rinsing out on the inside. And Shkifa Kishkifa Sakos, like a rinsing it out on the outside. So, according to this, they're both 
Okay, umirika v'shti, uh, v'shti marika v'shti for betzonin, and they're both cold water. So this is what we refer to beforehand. There would be a hot process beforehand to kasherit, a scalding water. But these, according to this mission, they both refer to a cold process, a cold water. One is on the inside, one is on the outside. Rinse it in, rinse it on the inside, rinse it on the outside. It's both cold water. Hashvud. Now, if you have a um, a what do you call it? A uh, a spit, the askala, or a or a grill. So that would be directly over a fire, Magila and Berotchi. So there, Bchamin. So there, you do Hagala. Now, the first use. This is the first use of the word Hagala. Hagala is a koshering word. Okay. So it's quite fascinating because I was throwing in before what we mentioned, Marika and Shifa. I was throwing in. It was preceded by a koshering process, but that hadn't been mentioned, right? I mean, we just did it right before in the Gemara, comparing it to koshering, saying why it's more than koshering. Okay. But anyway, here. The Gemara finally, when it was talking about Marika and Shifa, didn't hint at the idea that there was a koshering that took place. Here, when it talks about the spit and the uh, and the grill, it doesn't mention Marika and Shifa. It doesn't mention the ritual. It uses the verb of magilan. Okay, magilan, which is hagala, which is how you kasher, means immerse it in hot water. Okay, so you immerse it in hot water. So number one, it's interesting the shift talking about language of koshering. Number two, what's interesting is this is stuff that goes directly over the fire. And we normally assume that stuff that goes directly over the fire, right, you need to actually, you know, kosher it by directly placing it over the fire. Why is immersing in hot water sufficient? Okay, so we will end with this tantalizing mission uh, and pick up with this tomorrow. Yes. Two questions. One, back to the uh, 